Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the eighth webinar series on UAE corporate tax by RBS auditors. I'm Sri Devi, the host for this session. We are moving towards the last session of the transfer pricing series, so we would like to give you a very brief profile of our firm. We at RBS have a highly professional team offering one stop solution for a range of services in the areas of audit tax, advisory, and compliance. We have a dynamic management team, a core functional team, a core operational team, a vibrant support team for audit and tax, and a core consultancy team to effectively render all our services. Also recently, we have launched our own work platform, the RBS portal. This portal offers our client real-time work status update and has made our communication relatively easier. And moving towards today's session, we will be discussing the remaining areas of transfer pricing, covering mainly the topics of permanent establishments, business restructuring, advanced pricing arrangements, and compliances. Also, a general reminder before we move further. We have already covered the other videos in our previous sessions. So in case if you've missed any of them, you can watch them on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe and leave your valuable feedback to support us. We hope that today's session will be very informative to you and will help you further in your business. Now, I invite the speaker Mr. Sajin K. Ravi to take over. Thank you, Sri Devi, for giving a brief introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is our eighth webinar series relating to, uh, relating to corporate tax. And this one is a conclusion session relating to transfer price. We have conducted two webinar series relating to transfer price, and this one is the final one. So let's look at our agenda for today. So one is relating to, we will discuss some of the things relating to business restructuring. What are the TP methods adopted for business restructuring? Then permanent establishment, then uh, PE exclusion, then PE anti-fragmentation and the TP compliance. Then uh, three ways of documentation. What are the documentation adopted for transfer pricing like master file, local file and CBCR. Then APA advanced pricing arrangement and TP ad adjustment, then some example. So we'll, uh, because basically this is uh, relating to a more theory basis, we try to adopt some of the example to understand the concepts more clear way. So first, let's see what is a special transaction relating to business restructuring. So business, what exactly business restructuring? So business restructuring refers to reorganization of commercial and financial relations between related party or connected person. So basically, if you have a holding company and you have a, a related party, so you will be thinking about whether you want to acquire some companies from the other entity or acquire some companies from the new entity. You want to do a business control. So while doing a centralized control, you can control the entire function and risk in a greater manner. So that way you will do a business restructuring. So another matter, it is relating to cost management. If you want to reduce your cost up to the maximum level to increase your profitability. So in this scenario, you will be doing a cost management, uh, cost management in that scenario, business structuring will be doing. And another factor is relating to tax implication. For example, some companies are restructuring because of a tax implication. For in case of a UAE structure, if you see the mainland, it is a 9% and a free zone. A designated entity, it's a 0%. Then you may think about, you can do a business restructuring from mainland to free zone. That's again, it's depending upon the qualifying activity. So what are the rationale behind this business restructuring? <clears throat> so one is re relating to business control through centralized structure. So if you do a centralized structure, then you will get a better control and you can produce your entity in a group level. That means, uh, for example, H, a company, you can produce the entire group as a one community. 
So that's a one advantage uh, behind the rationale for business restructuring. And the second one is uh, relating to economies of scale. So for example, the holding company is purchasing, all purchases are done by holding company. Uh, then that will be reduce their cost. Automatically the supply will be, supply and purchase will be done by the holding company and distributed to the other related parties. Then automatically the wholesale purchase automatically reduce the purchase cost. So that will be uh, one of the reasons. And the third reason it is relating to better integration of acquired business. You are acquiring another business and you want to integrate those business into the community, that into the NDR group, then you are doing the uh, uh, business restructuring. So these are the uh, three rational behind uh, restructuring of the business. So what are the models applied for this uh, restructure? So first, uh, for example, function shifting. Because once you are done with the restructuring, uh, your function will be shifted. For example, function relating to risk matters. So you are one company is the entire purchasing of the raw material. Then that function may be shifted to another company because of the location advantages. That location having a lot of raw material. In that case, you may be shifting those function to another entity. Then another situation, it is relating to manufacturing. Core manufacturing may remain with the manufacturing entity and planning and procurement or inventory management given to other entity. So in that case, again, you are doing a restructuring of the entire business. Then another option, it is relating to purchasing that again, it is uh, <clears throat> either one entity will be purchased uh, for all requirement of the entire group. In that case, the, you will get a, you can do a wholesale purchase, then you can distribute it to and there are other entities. So that basis also, uh, this model will be applied. And the fourth one is a lower tax jurisdiction. That means you are shifting one location to another location because of one location, it is having a high tax and the other location, it's having a less tax. So automatically you are shifting from one country to another country in order to reduce your tax burden. So that's uh, these are the four model applied in the restructuring of the business. So another factor it is relating to typical model applied during restructuring. This is a basically Dembe. Dembe means it's a relating to IT related uh, concept. That means a development, enhancement, maintenance, protection, and exploration of intangible assets. So if you are if you are a holding company it's a developed those ip and you are shifting those uh, those development to the related party or connected uh, connected parties then what are the function you are shifting to uh, connected parties so these will be again you you will be uh, analyzing so again the main part it is relating to tax planning so whether it is 30% uh, uh, tax planning in one country that may be shifted to 9% tax in another country, then it will be a restructuring of the business and their restructuring of the business. If you say, if you, if you set up in another way, for example, in the UAE having a 9% tax in a mainland and uh, uh, 0% tax in a designated qualifying free zone. In that case, you may think about, you can shift from all operation from mainland to uh, uh, free zone. So in that case also business restructuring will come into the picture. Why transfer pricing come into business restructuring specifically? Once you are shifting from one location to another location, you are moving one tax seven country to tax seven country to another area. So the tax authority will definitely, they will check what is the reason behind this restructuring. So you must have a proper reason why you are restructuring your business. So that are the, these are the main things you have to consider before doing a restructuring of the business. So what will be the benefit while doing a restructuring? For example, for IT related uh, concept, there is a limited risk distributor, then uh, main distributor. So you are converting main distributor to limited, uh, limited risk distributor. These things uh, we have already explained in the webinar number two relating to FAR, uh, function analysis risk. In that case, we are uh, clearly mentioned about these things. So one company relating to their risk factors, you are moving one country to another country, then all these factors you have to carefully analyze. So what are the methods you are approaching for this transfer? So there are two methods are approached. 
One is the ALP method and the second one is the remuneration method. ALP methods uh, means uh, arm's length price. So first process, first step is uh, there is a four step process. One is actual transaction undertaken. What is the actual transaction undertaken? And the second thing, what is the special consideration for risk? That means what type of risk you are transferring. For example, holding company is doing entire procurement. That holding company procurement business, that risk has been shifted to another manufacturing company. So let manufacturing company take the entire procurement of their manufacturing unit. Then that will be a shifting of the restructuring of the business. After doing that special consideration of risk, you are once you have analyzed the risk matters, then next step is ALP arms length price. You have to find out what is arms length price. Then next one is a post restructuring. Once you have restructured the entire uh, entire structure, what will be the impact? So that is uh, that is the uh, two methods. It is OECD adopted. One is ALP method. Second is a remuneration method. Remuneration method means it's a post restructuring. What will be the control transaction? What will be the price adopted for that method? So these are the two methods adopted in uh, OECD uh, business structuring. So what are the approaches? For example, conversion. So fully fledged distributed into a limited risk distributed, that will be a conversion. That means you are changing the distributor risk category. First one, it is a fully, uh, fully fledged distributor. Then you are moving as a limited risk distributor. And uh, second one, second option, fully fledged manufacturer into a contract or toll manufacturer. So contract manufacturer, then toll manufacturer. Toll manufacturer will be taking very less risk factors than compared with the contract manufacturer, than compared with uh, real manufacturer. So these are the things. Then another one is a transfer of intangible from a central entity within the group. They are transferring intangible or rights to another group. So in that case, then another one is a concentration of function into a regional to the central central entity. Either you can keep it as a one region, they will do all function or central region will be take care of the entire function. So basically all far related, that means the function, risk, assets, all these function will be all far related will be checked. Then you will do the uh, business restructuring. We'll see one example to understand the concept thoroughly. See, for example, functional group of H group, HO, HO Limited is a parent company, MO Limited is a manufacturing company, and DO Limited is a distributor company. So if you look at this analysis, you can see R&D management review budget, it is done by MO Limited, that is a manufacturing. And if you come to strategic management, it is done by parent company. And if you see the back office support, that is done by back office support, that is done by the parent company. And IT support system, it is done by parent company and uh, regulatory matters, it is done by parent company. So it is, uh, if you look at this scenario, it is a H group, it is a devolved activities. The parent company is just carried out office activities, uh, head office activities like uh, uh, major legal related matters, strategic related decisions, all these things. But if you see at a manufacturing level, uh, HO limited, you can uh, see uh, all uh, procurement, uh, then uh, you can see the production areas, uh, then uh, the inventory area, all these things are uh, taken care of, uh, MO limited, that means manufacturer. So all this function wise, if you are shifting one of the company's uh, function to another company, see for example, MO limited in that one procurement, if you are shifting procurement to HO limited, let's HO limited uh, take care of the procurement function. In that case, you are shifting one of the uh, function to another area. So you have to decide which function you are shifting, which company you are moving, then accordingly it will affect the <coughs> uh, business restructuring. We'll see one more example. Here, the functional analysis of the C group, which consists of CP Limited, parent company, and a CM Limited, manufacturing company, and a CD Limited, distributed company. So in this, uh, here we can see that a group is a centralized activity. The parent company, CP Limited, is responsible for mainly for function like, uh, see, uh, CP Limited mainly for uh, research and development. Then you can see marketing and business, 
then strategic management, then day-to-day -day management, back office support, then asset category, you can see raw material stock. So the entire raw material has been purchased by the parent company and distributed to the manufacturers. And if you see the manufacturers function wise, then uh, you can see the procure, procurement function, it is done by uh, head office, but uh, the uh, production, it is in a manufacturing unit. So all procurement. So again, if a procurement is done, then inventory maintenance that will be done by CP Limited, parent company only. So the risk relating to those inventory or risk relating to the uh, holding of inventory, it is lies with the parents com parent company, not with uh, CM, CM Limited because CM Limited, just a manufacturer, he is getting, this company is uh, getting the units from the parent company. So parent company will be purchasing the entire uh, raw material for whatever the manufacturing of the units so the function will be shifted so this scenario your uh, business can be restructured to another way so the entire function has been uh, shifted to a manufacturing unit and you are shifting manufacturing unit from one location to another location then before analysis you have to see what is the benefit behind this uh, restructuring so what is the oecd alp concession so there is a post restructuring transfer pricing should be no difference on TP rules under first principle. That means even if you are doing a before or after the uh, transfer, there is no difference because again, you have to find out what will be the ALP for each transfer. So what is the current sta status? You have to identify pre and post restructuring function and risk assumed. So just now I have showed one example, two, uh, two example. One is relating to manufacturing company with a limited function and another one is a manufacturing company with all function and parent company with a limited function, parent company with all procurement function. So like that, whatever the function pre and post restructuring function, you have to analyze what is the current status. Then you have to identify what is the economic nature of what has been shifted. What has been shifted from one location to another location? You are uh, another option it is like you are acquired another new company in another country and you are shifting the entire procurement function into that country then you are shifting basically you are shifting from one country to another country that benefit may be relating to location wise benefit it may be relating to the tax related benefit or it may be relating to labor intensive benefit it may be for example the cost you can reduce so overall why the business restructuring has been done it's basically to reduce the uh, entire cost relating to the group entity then final one future state what is the business rational for restructuring just now i have discussed about what will the business rational whether it is for labor industry, whether it is for uh, tax reduce, uh, reducing or it is for a tax plan. So you have to decide all these things. But each stage, pre or post stage, you have to find out what will be the ALP price for these things. Now, what are the uh, <coughs> OECD approach for location saving? So location savings, one is uh, relating to cost saving. If you are relocating the business from uh, business from one location to another location because of a geographical location then the cost automatically whatever the cost saving will be uh, will be there then another factor is uh, relating to labor cost see for example labor in then intensive activity is a high cost country to low cost countries you are moving so one country it's uh, having a, a high labor cost then you are moving to the low uh, low intensive labor intensive activity to a low cost one then automatically the cost they can reduce then another one is relating to see before before doing the restructuring the related party the entire group they will check with uh, if i will involve in a, into a third party involvement what will be my benefit derived from that one that that one also they will check so location wise instead of doing with a related party if i will do it with a third party what will be the benefit derived from those transactions then that we'll consider. Then final one will be tax planning. So what will be the rational behind the tax authorities response relating to business restructuring? So you are doing a business restructuring, you are moving from one business to another location. Then what will be the implication? First, identifying and targeting restructuring. So usually some countries, they will, for example, Australia, they will ask for a form to fill 
uh, disclose the restructuring information. They have to update their master file, procure this in uh, TA, TA uh, tax authority. They will look into the what is the profit profile of the taxpayers disclosed in tax return, what will be the impact of the organization change. So basically, your entire organization history will be changed, then your uh, tax return will be changed, then you have to give a, a form relating to that matters. What will be what will be the restructuring plan another category it is imposing exit charges see one country is moving from uh, one uh, one uh, entity is moving from one country to another entity there will be an exit charges will be implied european union anti anti tax avoidance directive includes requirement for an exit charges so exit charges it's basically they will uh, they will calculate what will be the transfer then in that transfer the uh, exit charge will be imposed on that company then they can do it some countries they they follow these matters additional tax challenges like uh, permanent establishment taxing of permanent establishment you are moving from one country to another country withholding tax supply to payments made then uh, cfc rules then uh, increased uh, indirect taxes VAT, post restructuring so basically it's a lot of countries exit charges are restricted to capital gain so exit charges like for example 30 percent exit charges or 20 percent exit charges that will be applied to the capital gain and if you can analyze what will be the tangible asset and intangible asset you are transferred at the time of restructuring that will be applied on that exit charges so on that basis you will be calculated but some countries for example germany will seek to apply exit charges based on the net present value of profit transfer out of the jurisdiction so it's all depending upon each country wise uh, it's a decision so basically if you see at the uae level this law has been uh, not specifically says about what will be the exit charges but there is a clause saying that uh, then this will be released at a later stage so all these things will be come into picture so again all uh, business restructuring again it is aligned with oecd uh, oecd principles so uae has adopted uh, transfer pricing as per oecd regulations so basically all this information will be updated uh, in a uh, uh, few months so now we look at permanent establishment what exactly the permanent establishment we have just now seen what is a business restructuring in that concept also there is a one concept relating to permanent establishment so we will see what exactly permanent establishment so permanent establishment when does pe exist so one case is uh, relating to if the entity having a presence in the state in that case a pe will be uh, pe will be there then if a person is carrying on a business through pe then tax may be due in that state then automatically that means a state of establishment or state of residence in that case a pe will be involved then another case it is like a branch you have a branch in that company that country then automatically pe will be coming to the uh, place another last one is a fixed based establishment any fixed based establishment that attracts uh, tax liability in a second country in that case uh, automatically pe will be coming to the picture so what exactly pe means a fixed place of business through which business of an enterprise is wholly or partly carried on so whatever the business you are doing in a any entity that means a fixed place that place is a treated as a permanent establishment that means it, it must be a permanent establishment so in that oecd specifically says that just a mere presence of an enter, enterprise or mere presence of a permanent establishment doesn't mean that there is a pe so that we will check in a detail way in another slide so a uh, fixed place of business there is a, some permanency some permanency must be there in order to understand a fixed place of business otherwise uh, you, you cannot uh, you cannot uh, recognize as a pe if it is possible to demonstrate that there is no temporary nature to an operation it may not be a pe so if you want to specifically says that there is no temporary in nature in that case it may not be a p so this we will explain in uh, another example another area if an intent at an outset of a one performance then even a circumstance of sudden curtailing that means uh, if uh, for example a death of a uh, death of a owner or some cases like uh, 
that cases you are shutting down that business but you cannot say that you you are not involved in a pe that means so for example the pe fact is it's a clearly says that more than six months it's uh, then only pe will be considered so an establishment established uh, here in UAE, if it is more than six months is uh, over, then automatically it is treated as a permanent establishment. If it is uh, less than six months, then you have to see again whether it is a fixed place of business, whether you are uh, planning to continue a permanency in that one, whether you are doing an operation into that business, then only PE will be coming to the uh, picture. So what are the content relating to physical presence? So one is the place of management, your place of management, your company is situated in another country, but place of management is here, then automatically it is treated as a fixed permanent establishment. That means all managed strategic decisions are carried out in UAE, then in that case, the place of management will be treated as a P, automatically POEM, that means place of management. Then another case is a branch, then an office, office or land or building and other uh, real property, then a factory or workshop, then a mine or oil, gas, well, quarry, all other places it is uh, treated as a uh, permanent establishment. And even including vessels and structures used for such extraction, extraction of oil or mineral, whatever the category. Then if it is a vessel, then that vessel also treated as a PE if it is a part of that extraction. Another category, installation or structure for an extraction for natural resources, whatever the installation you are doing, that installation will be treated as a PE. Then a building site or construction project or assembly or installation project activity is for over six months. So all uh, temporary installment that will be treated as a PE, but provided that that must be uh, projected over six months. Then this is over six months, then only it is a treated as a P. Otherwise, it's a less than six months, then it is not treated as a, a P. But again, if that uh, less than six months, but if it is uh, if it is for a permanency in nature, then automatically it is treated as a P. So this is not a full list. So whatever the list it is coming, then you have to decide based on that legal nature, then place of management is there then automatically it will be treated as a permanent establishment. So what is the P exclusion? What will be excluded from the P? First category, it's a storage display of goods, a storage display of a goods belonging to an enterprise. So if you are just only storing of a goods or merchandise only belong to an enterprise, you are not doing any buying or selling or anything. It is just for storing purpose. It is just like a warehouse only for a related party, warehouse for a related party that is situated in another country, in that case, you are just storing, then it is treated as a, uh, no, it is not treated as a PE, that is excluded. Second category, the same category, maintenance of uh, goods, but it is uh, for the purpose of display or delivery. You are just doing a display, uh, just a delivery, that purpose only. So whatever the orders or anything, it's uh, happened in uh, head office level, then you are just uh, just uh, uh, deliver those goods to the uh, respective customer. In that case, stock of goods. So basically, they are just doing a stocking of goods. Another category, it is a stock of a stock of goods, but uh, it is mainly for processing by another enterprise. So these goods are mainly for processing for the uh, manufacturing unit, and you are just uh, holding those goods only for that purpose, then it is not treated as a P, even though it's uh, having a fixed place of business. Another fixed place of business solely for the purpose of purchasing of a goods or merchandise or collecting information for the enterprise. So you are just set up that business just for collecting information. So you are just doing a collecting information from the other enterprise, then it is not treated as a P. Then another category, it is relating to carrying on an enterprise, any other activity for the purpose of carrying on enterprise, any activity fixed place, but it is not relating to any, uh, any direct activity. That means it is only for the holding company purpose. You are just doing that one, then it is not treated as a fixed place of business. The final category, overall activity, any combination of the above, any combination of the storing or a fixed place of business, then any of this activity it's coming, then it is not treated as a P. 
So it's a, what is exactly if it is a proprietary or auxiliary to the business in nature or not sufficient to create a PE. So for example, one company uh, representative office here in UAE and that representative office, it is just a setup to collect or collect information from the another entity. Example, for example, you can take ICICA bank. They are not doing any, they are not accepting any deposit from UAE clients, but they are, if you want to do, if you want to do any uh, business, then you can submit those documents. You can submit those documents in that office, but that office, what they will do, they will directly send the entire information to the head office, head office in India. In that case, they are just collecting the documents. So in that case, it is not treated as a PE. Next one, PE, anti-fragmentation. So there is there is a concept like that uh, PE exclusion. So the people will try to exclude those things by utilizing fragmenting one coercive business into smaller operation. Then you are saying that there is no proprietary or auxiliary activity. So that is not possible. That means you are just uh, just putting into small small unit and you are doing and saying that okay, I'm not doing a major business. I am just uh, supporting the head office purpose. Then it is not treated as a PE. That is a, a separate. Uh, uh, anti fragmentation rule is uh, placed, and uh, there is an either existing PE in a local state or collective activities carried out by group companies. For example, you have a uh, existing PE in the local state and the collective by group, and this PE collectively doing some business in the local activity. Then you cannot say that it is not proprietary for auxiliary services. If it is a proprietary or auxiliary services, it is a, then it is a treated as a PE exclusion. But if local PE is just doing some activity, then you cannot say that this is a, a proprietary or auxiliary services in nature. So anti-fragmentation rule described applies only to the proprietary or auxiliary specific act activity exemption. So other than that one or cases, it will be automatically uh, treated as a PE. So next one is a PE agency. What will be the PE agency? So agency PE means where a person habitually concluded. So the previous cases, you can say that it is uh, relating to a fixed establishment. Agency here, it is a person habitually concluded contract on behalf of the enterprise or intermediary. So basically the person involved in a one business and he concludes the contract based on behalf of the enterprise, on behalf of the holding company or on behalf of the related party. In that case, a PE is treated as a PE agency. So what are the things uh, considered in order to consider as a PE agency? One first category, it is a related to closely related enterprise. Closely related enterprise means one enterprise has a control over the other enterprise by, by uh, the percentage or by the same person or enterprise, whatever the control criteria, then it is a related, uh, it, then it is treated as a closely related enterprise. Then Another category, independent agent. A person acts exclusively for on behalf of one or more enterprise, on behalf of related party, but that person cannot be considered as an independent agent if he is carried out 90% of sales to related party itself. So whatever the transaction he is doing, 90% of whatever the transaction, it is related to related party, then he cannot treat it as an independent agent. He cannot treat it as an independent agent and you cannot uh, uh, avoid from a PE status. An enterprise not deemed to have an PE where it carries on a business in state through independent agents. So if they are doing an in, uh, business with an independent agent, then not deemed a PE. Another category it is related to non-resident. So one, one concept is relating to closely related concept. Second concept is relating to independent agent. So if you are done a business with a 90% with a related party, you cannot say that independent agent. Automatically it is treated as a, uh, a PE only, P agency only. And uh, fourth one, non-resident agency will now exist where non-resident company goods or services are being sold in a local market. So whatever the product relating to the holding company or a product relating to the related party, you are selling those goods in the market with uh, limited involvement of non-resident. That means uh, whatever the transaction you are doing, 
the PE is doing that involvement, limited involvement of non-resident. That means the holding company is not involved in the distribution of that item, but a distribution is carried out by the PE. Then it is treated as a PE agency, for example, commission agent. So you are on the base of commission. So the title of the goods, it is uh, lies with the uh, manufacturer or lies with the holding company, but you are doing all sale or related uh, related matters in that location but you are getting based on the whatever the sale you are getting based on the commission in that case it is treated as a pe agency what will be the service pe service pe means such an employee is actually providing services to another stage provision of services uh, then automatically it will be created as a service pe another category it is relating to e-commerce for example, a server is uh, situated in a one country, but that server uh, server is accessed through different countries. Then you cannot say that a server a website, a website is uh, hosted on such server. That website is uh, uh, accessed in a different country. Then you cannot say that that country will be treated as a PE. For example, Google, Google is uh, situated in one country. For example, let's say US, US based one. And uh, the google it is access from here also then you cannot say that a pe exists in the e-commerce transaction so that is entirely different it is not treated as a pe but it is in a different digital economy that uh, oecd web session 13 they specifically says about a digital economy uh, that that will come into the picture it's not under pe category so what are the types of pe we have already discussed fixed place of pe then construction PE, construction uh, PE, it is uh, relating to the structure. Then agency PE, that is uh, relating to person. Then service PE, then again, we have just now discussed. So these are the PE, but if any proprietary or auxiliary character, then it is not treated as a PE. So let's see physical PE. Physical PE, just example, branch office, uh, then uh, uh, branch or office, etc. Then preliminary or auxiliary services are carried out then there is no p if income generating is carried out then it is a p if it is an agency whether it is a dependent then if p certain conditions are met then then automatically it is a p then independent agent then it is no p then construction or installation building site construction and installation etc if it is a p if duration exceed a specified limit 12 months or six months, uh, six months is the consideration whether to consider PE or not. Then uh, service PE, service performed by employees or other personnel. Then if service lasts beyond a specific time, then automatically it is tre treated as a service PE. So let's see one example to understand the concept in a good way. <clears throat> Here we have a, a functional analysis of a many group, which consists of Air Limited. Air Limited, it's a parent company parent company situated in the uk and uh, branch p limited uh, p limited in um, uh, uae and uh, c limited is an uh, unrelated party in uae so these are the uh, companies involved in this one so a limited is a parent company branch is a p so p is automatically coming to picture branch means automatically p will be there a company a is a parent company of many group ho in uk it has a core business procurement and sale of goods in uk so the core business it is a procurement and sale of goods in uk company a has p p it's uh, uh, we have already seen that p of a limited PA, company A has a P in UE that perform procurement activity on behalf of company A from an unrelated supplier in UE. So branch of parent company A in UE. So they are procuring uh, goods from a supplier C only for the purpose of parent company A. So the uh, uh, branch is just procuring goods for the purpose of parent company A. So we'll analyze this one. The PE habitually exercise the authority to conduct the business or business activity in UAE. PE does not own any title of goods at any point of time, nor has any entitlement to amount charged by company A from its customers. That means uh, uh, PE is not having any uh, title of goods, but entire title has gone to parent company and the customer's interaction with the customers and everything it is uh, done by parent company, the collection, then uh, the only delivery of goods has been happened from the uh, 
branch company company a pays a commission to p branch as a percentage of cost of purchase made on its behalf kindly analyze and arrive profit between p and its so so this is the scenario so let's see the <coughs> steps so first step you have to analyze for analysis so a limited function of sale of goods to an independent third parties and branch PE performing procurement support. So we are analyzed A limited. It is a function of sale of goods to independent third party and branch. It is a performing procurement support services and determine the compensation. Step number two, then you have to determine the compensation. What will be the compensation involved? So in this scenario, whatever the sale uh, procurement has been done by branch company on behalf of parent company, then parent company is paying some uh, commission to uh, branch B, branch, branch in UAE. So in that case, how the ALP will be determined, whether it is a P, automatically it is a P because a branch is already involved. Second case, whether they are conducting a business. Yes, they are conducting a business because on behalf of, uh, on behalf of a holding company, you are, you are procured the goods from the, uh, goods from the supplier C limited. So they are doing a business here. So automatically P is established. Second thing, uh, the business is established. And so third thing is uh, you have to arrive at what is what will be the ALP price. So you have fixed uh, whatever the price charged by parent company to branch company. So parent company is giving a commission based on the whatever the procurement that will be the that will be the price. But parent company, what they have to do, they have to just check if I am uh, if I am occupied with another supplier, another third party, what will the price I have to give to that company? That will be that will be compared. Then that will be the arm's length price. So hope that you understood that concept. Then now we will go to the main area transfer price compliance. So TP compliance. So we have discussed uh, first webinar, second webinar, what are the basic matters relating to transfer pricing, second five methods adoption. Then we have discussed uh, what is the FAR analysis, exactly what will be the FAR function risk and assets analysis. Then the final stage is relating to business restructuring we have uh, covered, then next one P. Now we'll see what will be the TP compliance. So what are the main thing, uh, main item? So arm's length price, this is a cornerstone of uh, compliance. So, so first part itself, arm's length ALP price is a cornerstone. Then you, you have to demonstrate that this will be the arm's length price. So how you will demonstrate, you have to finalize and see this is the price you are given to the related party and this is the price I am giving to the third party. So what will be the price I am, uh, whatever the price I have taken within that arm's length price. Then you have to see the compliance, what will be the maintenance of primary document and records, disclosure of tax authorities, time of filing of tax return, whenever you are filing a tax return, depending upon the criteria, then you have to disclose what will be the transaction between the related party. Then analysis to be made for the purpose of presenting a tax authority if so required. So if uh, tax authority is asking about the analysis, asking about the details, then you must present that these are the things, uh, how you arrive the transfer pricing. Then final one is a documentation. Pricing documentation tend to be highest cost of TP compliance and why it is highest cost. If you are not able to uh, demonstrate clearly the transfer price, then it will be the uh, tax authority will impose tax on whatever the price they come into the uh, model. That model, they will apply the price and they will charge additional tax. So next one, why documentation is important for tax authorities? So documentation of our tax authority would have only limited information. If you are submitting your tax return, only that tax return, uh, they will get an information. But with that information, they will not get uh, full details relating to your transfer price. So in that information, you will get you uh, whatever the sale to related party, they will get whatever the price adopted, but how that price, which method you are adopted. So those information is required in order to find out what will be the transfer price for those uh, transfer. So tax authority, they need uh, the full documentation. So documentation allow tax authority a lot more focused on the issues with the highest risk and manage resource in a better form. So tax authority need a proper documentation. What will be the price? What will the price you adopted for this 
transaction then on that basis you have to decide so why documentation is important for taxpayers one is a manager risk that's why we prepared transpricing TP documentation should be more than simply about meeting compliance requirements, then uh, reducing the transpricing risk factors, then uh, building with the OECD principle because uh, most of the countries are following OECD principle transpricing guidelines. So based on that guidelines, they are aligned with those guidelines. So you have to prepare the documentation relating to that one presentation. The documentation provide a platform on the taxpayer to present the case so if the tax authorities are saying that okay this will be the transfer price adopted for this transaction then you can say that okay this is my trans transfer price adopted for my situation and these are the methods adopted why this method is adopted what is the uh, uh, what is the uh, reason for adopting this method so you must have a proper document relating to this factor otherwise you won't able to uh, defend to the tax authorities then identification and management of tp risk it will help to identify the uh, transfer transfer pricing risk what will be the transfer price risk involved in this transaction so each category you have to analyze then only you will get an idea so that's why the transfer pricing is more important documentation part is more important for uh, taxpayers so what are the compliance issues so if you see the oecd tp guidelines so there are two concepts one is oecd tp guidelines second one is uh, uh, relating to what will be the domestic country what will be adopted if domestic country is adopted in a different method other than oecd method then you have to follow the domestic countries uh, rules here uae related matters uh, uae has adopted oecd transfer price guidelines so uh, you have to look at to the domestic data in order to uh, in order to see that what transfer price should be followed so taxpayer must consider domestic tp in compliance with oecd principle requirement so it's a, again even a domestic tp but again it's a compliance with the oecd principle so web session 13 they have approached uh, three tier uh, three tier concept one is maintenance of master file and second one is relating to local file and the third one is relating to cbcr reporting obligation so these are the three files you have to maintain for uh, transfer pricing compliance so compliance local ua related uh, uh, ua related things understanding the objective and the requirement of transfer pricing documentation first you have to understand what are the documentation required for this ue general tp disclosure form you have to submit a general tp disclosure form if you are coming into the within that range then you have to submit a tp form then you have to submit a master file relating to the transaction then you have to submit a local file then you have to submit a country by country reporting so these are the files required one is a general tp disclosure form then local file country by country reporting so compliance local so master file local file and a cbcr so master file uh, is required in case of a many group whose consolidated revenue is a 3.15 billion uh, billion aed in that case a master file you have to maintain and local master file and local file and if it is a standalone company where revenue of a taxable person exceed AED 200 million so if you take a local company if that standalone company it is exceeding 200 uh, 200 million in that case automatically it will be tp will be coming to a picture or your group level wise it is uh, uh, it is a uh, 3.15 billion it's uh, exceeding more than 3.15 billion then automatically uh, this will come into the picture and the CBCR applies to a business where, where MNE's group consolidated revenue is 3.15 billion. So it's basically 3.15 billion MNE group. In that case, the CBCR will be applicable. So what will be exactly the content of the master file? So master file contains specific information relevant, relevant for all MNE group. So master file, it is basically relating to MNE group, whatever the information to be included in the master file. So that is a master file part. So one is relating to specific information. One is relating to organization chart of the entire group. Then business discussion. What are the business discussion? Include uh, drivers. What are the profit drivers? Supply chain, main geographical market and functional analysis and business uh, business restructures then intangible whether the uh, intangible is involved in the in this one then what will be the intangible what will be a research and development facilities all this information you have to in include then financial transaction 
uh, whether it is a central financial unit or it is a diverse financial unit, then you have to decide on that basis. That information you have to include. Then financial position, including relevant tax uh, ruling. So whether you got a, any tax ruling, APA, uh, advanced pricing arrangement agreement, advanced pricing agreement from the tax authority. If that uh, information are included in that one, then you must include it in the master file. So these are the pricing arrangement you are received from the uh, tax authority in a so and so country, then that also you have to include the master file. So whenever looking into your file, then the uh, tax authority will be easily understand. Okay, you have received one uh, tax pricing arrangement from another country, from another uh, tax authority. So you have to follow this basis. So that's why this uh, financial position uh, you have to include APA. Then we'll uh, look into the local file. Local file, it is uh, relating to the uh, respective location, respective countries file. So that country, what are the information you have to include? Local entity. So local entity, organization structure, then business discussion, business strategy, and key competitors, who may be the key competitors. In that information, you have to include. Then detailed analysis of a related party, including the functional analysis. We have discussed what exactly the functional analysis that one you have to include then tp methods any apa or relevant ruling uh, ruling uh, for the local company then intra group uh, payment then local entities financial information financial information are relating to audit report then other uh, management report everything cbc uh, country by country reporting in that case, uh, it's uh, uh, country by country uh, reporting. In that uh, risk assessment, you have to report relating to revenue from both controlled and uncontrolled transaction, profit before tax, what are, how much is the income tax or corporate tax, whatever it is paid, then current tax accrual, then stated capital, accumulated earnings, number of employees, tangible assets, then template is uh, provided by OECD and uh, taxpayers are followed those template or the respective respective country depending upon uh, de depending upon the country wise country then UAE we have already adopted a different format so that basis so each country it has adopted to respective uh, respective place uh, legal structure wise they have modified uh, some of the information so let's see one example to understand what exactly master file local file uh, relating to transactions See, for example, we have a functional analysis of a C group, which consists of CP Limited parent company and CM Limited manufacturing company and CD Limited, it's a distributor. So a bicycle manufacturer country A, it's in a CM Limited, that is in another country, CM Limited manufactures that bicycle and sells bicycle to CP Limited parent company. So parent company, it is a just like a doing a strategic uh, strategic management only, not having a full detail. So manufacturing, it is done in another country. So CM Limited is a bicycle manufacturer in a country A, sells bicycle to CP Limited, which distributes the bicycle to CD Limited, which resells the independent enterprise to an unrelated bicycle dealer in country B. ABC Limited. So the uh, the third party it is involved in a third party ABC Limited. So there is a resell. It's a happen from country B, that is a CD Limited to third party ABC dealer in ABC Limited. So in this scenario, so one is a parent company CP Limited, then manufacturing company in another location, another country CM Limited, then country B another distributor. So distributor that CD Limited. And B from country B, that CD Limited distributed from a dealer ABC Limited, resale bicycle to independent company. So in this scenario, what will be the group overview? So you have to do a group overview of shareholding structure. Shareholding structure, if you see the shareholding structure, you have to do parent company, then CM Limited, then CD Limited, and their group level structure you have to do a brief discussion of the business operation of the group uh, the entire business operation of the group level then uh, whatever the range of product service geographical presence and a sales trend then a brief discussion of the business operation of cm limited cm limited is a uh, it's a manufacturing unit so you have to give a brief discussion about the cm limited then what will be the price adopted for a cm limited to cp limited what is the price adopted? So all this information you have to include. Then next one, it is relating to um, 
so first one a group overview we have done with a group overview so next process is relating to industry overview of the group c limited so what are the industry structure type of bicycle produced and sold in the market size what is a market size demand and supply then gap analysis then characteristics of a bicycle industry distribution channel what is a distribution channel brief overview of a legal and regulation of the industry factors affecting demand sales trends then uh, key growth drivers sort analysis strengths uh, weakness opportunity and uh, thread then a way forward future production all these things so you have to analyze the industry overview of the group then next step is relating to for analysis we have a functional analysis of the c group c cp limited is a parent company cm limited is a manufacturer that means the manufacturing of a bicycle and a cd limited is a distributor so you have to see that uh, cd here we can see c group is a group with a centralized activity uh, the parent company cp limited is responsible for many group function as a result also hold a lot of group asset and carries a lot of risk so if you look at this a cp limited parent company you can see the r and d it is done in a parent company level procurement procurement it is done in a parent company level and you see marketing and business development is done in a parent company level and cd limited also uh, distributor also then a strategic management day to day management uh, back office support all this uh, all this transaction it is done by parent company so uh, function asset risk so uh, asset wise if you see raw material stock it is uh, parent company is uh, holding the raw material stock then uh, design intellectual property parent company is doing that uh, cycle manufacturing whatever the the uh, intellectual property design and everything it is uh, it is all by cp limited the parent company and the production equipment you can see the production equipment it is done by manufacturer because a manufacturing unit it is set up in a cm limited so production equipment in cm limited then manufacturer know how it is in a cm limited and if you see the all, first part it is you can see r and r and management review and budget everything it is done in parent company but r and performance because performance is happened in manufacturing unit so that is done in cm limited so this is a far analysis for the group level so you have analyzed the parent company then you have analyzed the corresponding manufacturing company then you have analyzed the distributor company so you have to analyze what is a function what is a asset what is a risk and each company wise which are the areas they are involved in then you have to analyze if you see the distributor company then they are just doing the marketing related part then uh, uh, second part is uh, relating to sales to the customers. They are distribution. So sales to the customer. Then day-to-day -day management, you can see uh, CM limited manufacturing unit because the manufacturing unit are relating to that uh, respective factors. They have to do day-to-day -day, uh, activities. So parent company also it's involved and uh, distributor company also involved. Back office support, if you see the only parent company, the others are, it is uh, not involved. And if you see the customer list, so distributor having the full customer list. So this is basically analysis of the entire company. So we have analyzed the three group level, then industry level, group overview, industry overview, then for analysis of the entire group. So this is the base for the master file initial input. So let's see the summary. So what are the information you have to do the entire TP study? So we have uh, discussed input factors, industry overview, group overview, FAR analysis. So we have detailed why FAR analysis is very important. So this uh, we have covered. Even, even if you look at into the webinar series two, you, can, you will get a clear cut picture about exactly what uh, FAR analysis. Then next process after once input analysis is over, next process is economic analysis. So then you have to find out who is a tested party, then benchmarking, search process, then qualitative analysis. Then once you are done with all these things, then output will be arm's length price. You have to decide what will be the arm's length price. So you have to see that what is the tested party's price, then what is the other related party's price, then you have to do the adjustment, then you have to arrive at the arm's length price, ALP price. So this is the entire study, TP study. So TP study, you simply cannot put like just like a trade license or just like the uh, legal structure documents that's not enough in order to give a proper tp study so proper tp study means all function wise you have to analyze major area it's a far analysis 
the other areas industry overview group overview it is very easy one but the next area for analysis uh, selection of tested party benchmarking process qualitative analysis all these are economic analysis are important in order to get a clear cut a tp study now we we have come across the documentation then we will see what exactly advanced pricing arrangement why we have to do the pricing arrangement see advanced pricing arrangement is an administrative approach to avoid transfer pricing dispute from arising in uh, arising by again in advance the criteria by applying an alp price that means one country is involved in one price then another country is involved in another price so you have to you have to come into an arrangement you have to fix on a price so that's why advanced pricing arrangement it will come into the picture so there are uh, three methods one is a unilateral method then uh, another one is uh, relating to bilateral method and the third one is a multilateral method the oecd tp now states that the bilateral api is the best method to adopt so what exactly unilateral uh, unilateral it is made between the tax payer and the respective tax administration it deals with the tax issues it uh, deals with uh, uh, relating to the tax issues but unilateral means only one authority that means you are interacting with the only one authority then it is unilateral that means only to the tax administration not to the other party of the uh, ta the tax authority bilateral means bilateral or multilateral api are referred to as map or apa and will be agreed upon under map and other mutual uh, agreement procedure with the other ta that means both tax authority will be agreed on both the side that means a bilateral so multilateral means uh, it's uh, uh, too many apas will be involved that means a series of a complementary bilateral api with each of the countries using bilateral procedures so one is unilateral it's only one side it's a basically so it is uh, recommended that ta must be informed to the competent authority that this is we have decided then that competent authority will be checked with the, that respective uh, related party then uh, because that country adopted this way then you must do an adjustment in their respective country so what is the process in the apa one is a discussion so expression of interest or preliminary discussion and the second one is application formal submission of an application to the authority then evaluation of the application then a final one is the agreement with the terms so these are the agreements so it's a simple process but the steps involved first we have to analyze what is the initial package submission document to be submitted what are the documents required for this one then expression of interest to determine whether if we will process with the apa whether we will gain benefit from the both the parties whether that APA is required, whether it will benefit for the both party, then you can do an expression of interest. Then you have to submit a formal application. A return format should be include a critical assumption respect to economic and operational condition. You must have a properly documented those information. Then review and evaluation by tax authority. Then it will go to the tax authority. They will review. Then next process is uh, relating to negotiation. Negotiation process it's having a two-step process. Uh, first process it's a fact finding uh, and review evaluation. Competent authority will doing a discussion with the taxpayer and then they will evaluate your case. Then next uh, it will be second process. It will be moving to TA to TA. That means one tax authority in one country to another tax authority in another country. So the taxpayer involvement will be very less. Then agreement, the final signing of the advanced pricing agreement, then both the authority will be decide this will be the price for this transaction. Then uh, finally it will be agreed, then implementing those uh, compliance. That will be the process of uh, APA. So what will be the duration? APA will be, uh, usually it will be uh, shorter than one year, but do not normally go beyond five years. So let's say we can say that between one to five years, that will be the APA one. Next one is relating to transfer pricing adjustment. What exactly you have to do the transfer pricing adjustment once uh, that we will discuss. So why transfer pricing adjustment uh, involved? So we will see the key factors. One is a double taxation, potential for double taxation. Second one is a corresponding adjustment. Then third one is a OECD mutual agreement procedure map. And the final one is arbitration. So what exactly potential double taxation? Double taxation will be involved then now. Uh, there are uh, two concepts, uh, juridical or economic in nature. Juridical means 
uh, okay, so when a tax is imposed in uh, two territories on the same taxpayer in respect of same income. For example, you have a branch situated here in UAE and you have a holding company, main holding company is situated in UK. So branch is not having a separate legal entity as it is, even though having a trade license and everything, it will be consolidated with the holding company level. So holding company level income is already taxed along with the holding company level income is taxed to branch income also consolidated at uh, holding company level automatically tax will be charged in uk similarly here in a branch you are uh, you are earning some income here in ue automatically you have to pay tax so that is a juridical tax because a uh, two country one country it's already taxed because of the consolidation level branch is uh, consolidated at uh, uh, holding company level then uh, here it is a PE status, automatically a branch is attached. Then automatically double taxation will come into future. Then another one is economic uh, economic DT. In that case, when more than one tax authority includes the same income in the tax base of a taxpayers. For example, the dividend distributed, it is a dividend is already attached. Then in the hands of the shareholder, it is already, again, it will tax in some countries, not in UAE. UAE uh, withholding taxes a zero percent and dividend also exempt and then come to the uh, the global income part wherever the country what are the income received from those things again it will be taxed so that it's a double taxation so those cases automatically double taxation involved and uh, Another factor is relating to, for example, OECD TP principle. If not all countries are adopting OECD TP principle, in that case, automatically double taxation will come into the picture. For example, we'll see A Limited is a resident in a country A. A Limited sold goods to B Limited. B Limited is a resident in a country B. B Limited made a 35 million profit in country B. A Limited sales 160 million to B Limited. Profit of A Limited is 20 million. Profit of uh, A Limited is 20 million. And uh, Tax Authority has conducted an audit and determined additional TP of adjustment of 2 million. So 2 million has imposed additional TP adjustment by Tax Authority. So pre TP adjustment, A Limited profit was at 20 million. Then post TP adjustment, they have done adjustment of 2 million. So automatically 22 million. In a country B, profit in B limited 35 million. This is a uh, in a B limited another country. This is also 35 million. So if you see, it's a 55 million. It's a pre TP adjustment, but post TP 57 million. But in a B limited, they are not done any adjustment. So you have to do a corresponding adjustment in their respective country. So that's why it's a corresponding adjustment is required. There need to be a corresponding adjustment proven to 2 million adjustment from being attached to both the countries. So what is a transpricing audit? So audit is carried out by transpricing authorities. Preparation of documents uh, reduce a risk as a transpricing audit is either unilateral or uh, multilateral or bilateral. TP auditor rarely produce one correct answer. So it's uh, it will be like automatically, it will be like uh, uh, one you will not get a correct answer one answer so it will be uh, ta will give another price you will be supporting with another price so again it will be they have to decide then best strategy cooperative approach active involvement from the beginning transparency and guidance submission of a supporting evidence audit can involve more than one ta tax authority in a three-way engagement involving the taxpayer so one country is TA, then another country is TA, then taxpayer. So both option it is possible. What is a uh, what is a map? Map is a mutual <coughs> agreement procedure. So basically, mutual agreement procedure it is uh, relating to both the countries uh, decided that okay this will be the price adopted for this one. Then automatically the uh, map will be come into the picture. And the map uh, the taxpayer must present in a case within three years from the first notification of the action resulting in a tax session. So if the TA TA is uh, produced that this will be the price adopted for this transaction, then you are supporting you are not adopting that price. Then you have to within three years you have to submit uh, the notification then there is no requirement normally for the competent other to come formal agreement to a resolution they shall enter 
So this is a map. Once map is over, then the final one is arbitration. Arbitration is not an extension of map. So taxpayer can initiate not earlier than two years after the date the case was first presented. So in a map also, you are not agreed for that price, then uh, you can go to for arbitration method. That means arbitration is a final stage method. As a request, arbitration must be made in writing and will not grant it where decision has already. So if it is a decision is already decided in the previous cases or anything, then you, are, you cannot go ahead with the arbitration. Taxpayer cannot request arbitration when issue a stake has been previously ruled upon domestic court or administrative. So even if you are in another country, but the domestic court is already, tribunal has already released relating to this matter, then you cannot go ahead with the arbitration. Then taxpayer does not agree with the outcome of MAP. Only unresolved matters can be referred, referred submitted for arbitration. So it's a basically it's a, uh, if a MAP under MAP process you cannot take any decision, then it will go to the arbitration. But that arbitration again, you have to see that whether any decision has been issued previously, then you cannot do any arbitration. So let's see one uh, cross border corresponding adjustment. So A Limited is a resident in UAE. A company A is a UAE resident entity, sells finished goods to its local related party, party company X. Company A has a TP policy in place and goods to RP at a 6% markup. So company A has a TP policy and markup will be there put at 6%, but a tax authority assessed the TP fixed at 8%. So you have fixed the price at a 6%, but tax authority has fixed the price at a 8%. So there is a uh, gap involved in this one. So if you see the revenue from a TA accordingly adjusted profitability of the company A as follows. Revenue from the company X, it's a TP before adjustment of 5.3 million and after adjustment, it's a 5.4 million. And operating cost is a 5 million for the both case. Or before and after profit is uh, previously before adjustment it was a uh, 300,000 so you are reported like a 300,000 profit and the TP after adjustment the TP has decided that the profit should be 400,000 then you have to pay a tax on 400,000 so as a result of the above adjustment company A so first this uh, this is a relating to company A scenario so the company A scenario they have to pay uh, based on the TP adjustment, 400,000. But there will be a double taxation impact because the company H, we are not, uh, we are not done any adjustment in company H. So then you have to, what you have to do, you have to do an adjustment in a company H also. So this is in a one country. So you have to do the adjustment in the next country also. So what will be the impact for the next country? Let's see. Revenue from the third party is uh, 6.5 and 6. Point, this is a revenue from the third party. And the cost of finished goods from the company A. So this is the 5.3 million they have purchased from the company A. So this is a cost of finished goods. So cost of finished, uh, for example, the previous example, you can see the uh, sale of the previous company. It's a 5.3 before adjustment and 5.4 is after adjustment. So the cost of finished go goods automatically, you have to change from 5.3 million to 5.4 million automatically. The profits uh, before adjustment 1.2 million, then they have to reduce it to 1.1 million. So this is the corresponding adjustment in the other country. So you have to decide it's a, even if it's a transfer pricing, it is not only the one country involvement, it will be involved in a two countries. So that's why the transfer pricing documentations are very important. So even if you are uh, concluding with the one country, then again, the, the tax relating to other country will be uh, different. So if by doing this adjustment, you can see a downward adjustment, downward profit adjustment. See, previously it was 1.2 million. It was uh, now it is 1.1 million. So this is the uh, adjustment uh, done in the other country. So we are done with the transfer pricing uh, webinar three. So this is the all information relating to TP. So we have covered uh, the extensive way. It's in a first webinar and second webinar and third webinar because uh, it is uh, not possible to complete uh, entire transfer pricing in a one webinar series. That's why we have covered a three webinar series. So this is a conclusion session for the uh, TP. And we may uh, come up with the next webinar uh, depending upon uh, whatever the importance. So if you guys have any other areas you want to cover, you can just message it. Then we'll uh, look into that matter. 
And uh, we are planning for next one is uh, relating to deferred tax. What will be the deferred tax impact between uh, deferred tax and current tax? What you have to report in the financial year 2023, whether you want to report a deferred tax asset or liability in a 2023 financial statement or 2024. So that's uh, one critical matter. Second part is uh, relating to taxability of individuals and sole establishment partnerships and whatever the uh, regulations issued by FTA, we may come across uh, some of the webinar series. And uh, this is our uh, socials, uh, social media. Uh, you can uh, just go through, then uh, LinkedIn, uh, we are, then uh, YouTube, we have uh, released a lot of videos, then you can go through that one. And in case you have any queries or any uh, other matters relating to today's webinar, you can uh, you can email rbs at rbs accounting or info at rbs And uh, you can see our YouTube channel and we are released uh, all other uh, webinar one and transpricing one and transpricing in two, it's there. And uh, this one will upload, uh, the third one will upload after within a couple of days time. Then a previous webinar also, you can just go through the city related matters. And we have already included some of the things relating to anti-money laundering. And we have released some of the videos relating to UBO, then anti-money laundering, and some of the complaints part, part relating to AML related matters. Uh, then uh, this is uh, all about uh, the transfer pricing. So this is just like a, a, a real fact is related tra transfer pricing. It is a, a lengthy subject. Uh, so even for the guidance note, they have clearly mentioned 139 pages uh, relating to transfer pricing. But uh, the rest of the information they have given us uh, not saying that whatever the information further you want to check, uh, just refer OECD guidelines, then you will get a full information. So this is 139 pages. It's not enough to complete the entire matters. Thank you for joining this uh, webinar series. Uh